So uh, welcome everyone to the uh, fourth day of uh, SEMLA webinars, SEMLA going virtual. Thank you very much for joining us again for another uh, exciting uh, talk. Um, so for those of you that are joining for uh, the first time, uh, a few words about uh, what SEMLA is. So as the name recommends, uh, SEMLA is working uh, at the cross-section between software engineering and machine learning. Uh, the basic argument is that uh, it's one thing to uh, build your models, train your models and your algorithm, and a very different thing, implementing these models in software and uh, putting them in, in, uh, uh, in real life applications. So we're exploring issues about issues and challenges on the development of uh, machine learning uh, applications. So uh, SEMLA is organized at Polytechnique Montreal by, uh, by faculty. So uh, we are Bram Adams, Julian Antoniol, Jing Hui Cheng, myself, Marius Fokayev, Spoots, Com, and Malek Nazna Ebi. We're all professors at the Department of Computer and Software Engineering at Polytechnique Montreal. So we have uh, an, exciting, an exciting lineup of, uh, of speakers. Uh, you have already uh, seen uh, three talks. And today we have uh, the fourth, which is going to be given by uh, Grady Butch. We're very, very excited to have Grady uh, in, our, in our panel. Uh, Grady is a uh, chief scientist for software engineering at IBM Research. Uh, he's best known as one of the fathers of uh, the UML language and uh, object-oriented programming. He is a founding member of the Agile Alliance and a founding member of the Hillside Group. He has an amazing uh, publication record with, uh, with books and hundreds of uh, technical uh, articles. Uh, Grady is also uh, exploring the, the creation of, uh, of a documentary uh, called Computing, uh, the Human Experience. So uh, there is a link on the website. We invite you to, uh, to follow up uh, on his work, uh, and I think with that I can pass it to to Grady to share his uh, screen, and uh, we can start the uh, the talk. Thank Thanks you very much. much. Um, let me actually chat on video for a moment because I brought a little friend with me here. Oh, so there we go. So hi, I have a little friend. I, I probably one of the few people here in Maui that have three robots living with them. This is. This is Noelle because she came to us over Christmas one year and I've got a sister of her and then over in another room I've got uh, Pepper which is the big sister, the big sister of the three. Uh, we first started using Now, uh, the, the, the Now robot from Alder Baron oh, several years ago when uh, the Hilton Hotels approached us and said, hey, we'd like to put a concierge inside our uh, hotels that could be uh, could that could serve not to replace the human but but to augment them could you do that for us and that led me on a really fascinating journey uh, that I'll tell you some of the stories about today but one of the things that I learned from my journey into AI is that while there are some tremendous exciting things going on within the domain of deep learning itself Ultimately, it's a problem of systems engineering. So in the next 45 minutes or so, I'll save some time for questions and answers here. I want to take you on a bit of that journey and explore with you some of the things that I have learned in trying to bring AI to the real world. Let me set her down here. Okay, um, let's share a slide. Let's see, if only I knew how software worked. Uh, share screen, there we are. Uh, yes, I'm gonna stop your sharing. Here comes mine. Let's make sure I get the right one, and here we are. Okay, can everybody see that? I assume so, because I don't hear anything from you. Okay. 
So um, here's how you can reach me if you wish to over uh, after the presentation. Um, several years ago when IBM was just stepping into AI in a big way uh, with the Jeopardy challenge, we won the challenge and then shortly thereafter David Ferrucci uh, asked me to come in and help his team document the as-built architecture. So what, what they needed is they were moving from the research uh, world and trying to put this out in the product. And that's a story unto itself. But let me just focus upon what the good folks at Jeopardy did. It was an interesting life cycle for them because they were not building just an AI, but rather building a system that encompassed, encompassed literally hundreds, if not a few thousand AI algorithms. So the testing was one that required a systemic look at the world. In fact, the, the key architectural mechanism that, that uh, Watson Jeopardy used had nothing to do with AI whatsoever. It was entirely just uh, a pipe and filter uh, or organization using a mechanism, an open source mechanism called UEMA. And what that enabled was their ability to put in lots of small machine learning and statistical learning approaches into a larger structure that all work together. Now, at first I thought that was you know, unusual, but as I have gone further into the AI world, I realized, no, that's the essential issue. Uh, the one clear lesson I hope you get from my presentation today is that while Focusing upon the AI aspects of a system is right and noble and the good thing, and I'm delighted that, that the professors here at the, university, at the university are doing that. Trying to build those systems and bring them to the real, real world is a systemic issue. So the problem is not so much, for me, trying to better engineer machine learning processes, which is important, but rather trying to better engineer systems that have AI components. Let me give you an example of that. <clears throat> As part of this work we were doing in AI, you, you saw the robots down there. I pivoted from just the textual oriented things that the Watson team was doing into what we called embodied cognition, meaning taking a system and putting it into the real world. A lot of the AIs that we see these days, they're input output black boxes i take an image i get some classification of them out that's all well and good but my work was looking at a little bit different problem which was taking these systems that were in the physical world themselves as rodney brooks has once observed we probably can't really think of a system as intelligent unless it is in the real world because there we must deal with all sorts of, of nasty things, a noise, ambiguity, and the reality that there are models of the real world that probably are in conflict with what I see in the world. There was an interesting use case with this particular robot. You're looking at the Robonaut 2, which is a robot that NASA has put on board the International Space Station. There's actually not one there right now, but it was brought to the earth and it's gonna be sent back again. There's a whole series of robots that have been trying to put up there. Uh, Simon, a small, about basketball size. Another robot um, that uh, is called the Astro B. They're all free floating kinds of things. Now, why a humanoid robot? Well, NASA had two ideas in mind. Uh, first of which is, this is a robot that they would like to, uh, they wanted to put uh, on the surface of Mars before the humans arrive, and so this is an area of experimentation. And additionally, they had built systems, i.e. the space station, that were meant for humans, and so it made sense to build a robot that adapted to the human environment as opposed to building a robot that the environment itself adapted to. Now the interesting thing about the Robonaut 2, because of the nature of its use cases, is that it was big, it was very powerful. It could punch a hole in the side of the wall of the International Space Station, which would not be a good thing. <clears throat> and it had no legs. It had actually hooks on the bottom of it. One of the use cases they had in mind was it would float about and then do a lot of cleaning, tedious things that the humans themselves had to do. Uh, 
So this led us to an interesting realization. Yes, we sort of knew how to build a system, how to interact with a human, but it was possible for this system to do things that were very, very dangerous. How do you test that? Because you don't want to try punching a hole in the side of the spacecraft. How do you give yourself a high level of confidence that the system as a whole does the right thing? And indeed, it led us to throw a number of use cases at it that were very much in the philosophy of Asimov's three laws. Now, I'm not saying those are a guiding principle for you for testing, but they certainly were a very interesting way for us to look at the problem. <clears throat> so let's step back for a moment and look at non-AI systems, and we're going to sneak up on the problem that way and then see where AI fits into the matter of things. If you look at the nature of large-scale uh, software systems today, they have gone through a fascinating evolution, and this, this chart uh, tries to express a little bit of it. I mean, in the earliest days, we built just monoliths that ran on one machine, and then they became distributed, and then they moved to the cloud, and then we saw devices, and so we have this, this incredible spectrum of devices that are out in the real world. One of the things that's happened in ultra-large, high-availability systems is that we've seen the growth of platforms, and that's the nature of this, this circular purple thing with the squares in it in the upper right-hand side. So you have systems that are out in the cloud. Uh, Kubernetes and the notion of containers is driving that direction of those kind of systems. And so the current architecture we see happening in this space is that of microservices. And there's a, another story unto itself, but there's a whole transition organizations are doing from monoliths into microservices, and it's a wrenching transformation for some. But that architectural pattern has a number of important implications with regards to the life cycle, how I develop, how I deliver, how I test. In fact, it's probably been a good thing, although it will be a painful for some as they move to that transition, because the essence of microservices leads us to the same problem I encountered with building systems for the Robonaut 2. I have a system as a whole that I know I need to, that needs to work, but there are lots of small pieces in it. And the systems engineering principle tells us quite clearly, and this is something that's been learned through literally decades of experience, is it building a system with a clear separation of concerns of parts so that those parts can be tested by themselves and the system as a whole tested, and in fact those parts can be deployed separately, that just simply works quite well. If you look at the architecture of in more detail into these kinds of systems, you'll see that it's not quite evident here, but look at the little hexagonal things. The architecture that's beginning to dominate is that of containers and microservices. So the essence of it is that I treat each logical part as a literal service that can be deployed independently of one another. And that has implications not just functionally, but also for the team organization, because in general, you will organize your microservices around a small team and vice versa. In fact, if you show me your organization, I can probably tell you your microservices architecture. Um, now, the world of AI is very different, however. Um, if you saw at the opening slides here, the books behind me, a lot of these deal with uh, uh, AI and software architecture, and I've been collecting a lot, of, a lot of studies with regards to software architecture patterns. The book by Mary Shaw, simply titled Software Architecture, is the classic book in that space, and also you should take a look at Eric Gamma and the Gang of Four, their book on design patterns. And what's emerged in the non-AI world is the realization that there are indeed a set of, of common patterns, reusable designs, if you will, that we see over and over again that are well proven. We aren't there yet in the world of machine learning. Uh, we're looking here at a basic representation of AlphaGo. And what we know from AlphaGo is that it was a hybrid system. Yes, the good folks at DeepMind tout the AI pieces of it, but ultimately it was a system that had neural network parts, the essence of it, but there were a lot of symbolic parts as well. If you dive into just the AI part of it, the neural networks, there's an interesting story here because they started with a multi-level neural network 
very complicated one. And then from Alpha Go, they began to hone it further into what became the architecture Alpha Zero, which was an evolution of the early architecture. They began to apply it to a whole number of things. There's an interesting lesson in this, which is all good systems like this tend to evolve in their architecture, and this is true even for AI systems. Now, I used a couple of important phrases here I want to go back to, the notion that the, the DeepMind folks had a, uh, a hybrid system. This is very much the kind of things we see within AI systems these days, hybrid in the sense that there are neural parts, but there are also symbolic parts, and these two weave together. So whereas most of the th work that you all may be doing is just in the AI part, keep in mind that you're always doing this as part of a system, and you always have these, these symbolic parts around you to make it real. It, it's interesting because the pendulum keeps swinging back and forth between these two models, the symbolic and the connectionist the neural models of computation. But most importantly, both of them are computationally equivalent. Uh, they're turning complete, both of them. Each has an advantage to express a solution in a particular way. I'm not going to describe my banking system using a neural network. On the other hand, I'm not going to uh, write my image recognition system in COBOL. They each are similarly computationally expressive, but from the human perspective, they're, they're quite different. Each also has different deficiencies that we'll dive into in a moment. And with regards to scalability, latency, resiliency, all of these illities, their risk profiles are very, 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 very different. Let's do another example here that shows you the system nature of it. <clears throat> About a, a few months ago, uh, Europol, the uh, European uh, police arm of Interpol, put out this message and said, we have these pictures. Uh, there's a, a child being sexually abused. Do you recognize this city? Turns out this is a very common thing that happens in this space, that Europol and the FBI and others do this all the time. They look at these images and try to find uh, clues as to where the location of it is, because there's, there's potentially a child in immediate danger. Well, this was posted on October 15th, and literally a few hours later, this gentleman came back and said, I found it. In fact, he gave GPS locations for it, and he gave information from a Google map as to how he found it. This was a fascinating problem that was solved by a human, but as it turns out, it's a problem that could be automated. So a little bit further on this, here's how he did it. He looked at, he knew it was Asia, because that's what Europol said. He looked at their architecture and then began to find those patterns that had some similarities. And then he then began to look in the backdrop and he recognized the hills and said, oh, I see the backdrop here and started looking at uh, uh, Google Maps from first an aerial view that got him to the basic region and then did the Google Street View to get him precisely where it was. A human was able to do this. So can, let's, let's tease this apart for a moment and consider what he did. He identified architectural styles, which we know we can automate from Google has done this themselves. He matched those styles to the places, also very automatable. He was able to identify local topology. We see that happening already in AI. He matched those topologies to places. He matched the building features and he matched it to Google Earth data, all eminently automatable. This, therefore, is a systems problem with AI components. It is not an AI problem that needs to be better engineered. And it's a system that involves pattern matching, uh, geometric translation, searching, and constraint resolution, all symbolic kinds of things that require uh, a neural network aids. A lot of symbolic computation is about these things, manipulation, presentation, et cetera, processing large volumes of data, and model making and using model, models that we can then uh, throw, uh, throw data at, simulate it, come back with things. This is what our, our models do in climate uh, modeling, in COVID modeling, and in um, uh, and weather modeling as well. A lot of contemporary AI is very different, and not to disparage what's going on here, but a lot of AI is about dealing with pattern matching of signals on the edge. I've got an image, can I classify it? A lot of it is also about inductive reasoning. 
but it's not today yet about decision making and abductive reasoning. Now, what is abductive reasoning? Abductive reasoning is theory building. It's looking at a set of things and building a model from them, trying to extract a theory. So you have a theory of mind about me that I am actually a human and not a robot, although some may, may question that. That's abductive reasoning at play. And a lot of what we see in AI has not gotten there quite yet. So we're going to see that progress, but right now we're on really mostly the signal side, signal side of it. Uh, contemporary AI is really not that modern in a sense. Uh, there are two things that have changed it in the last decade, and it's been a perfect storm. Uh, the accumulation of large bodies of data. Thank you, Google, for watching over every keystroke I do. And thank you, Facebook, for tagging me in every photo and being able to identify me. These companies in particular have tremendous amounts of data from which they have been able to build. And finally, the abundance of computational power as born in, in a lot of uh, GPUs and the like. That being said, a lot of the algorithms that we see in the AI space really are a few decades go, uh, old. We're incrementally improving them, but it's not like there's been a, a, a earth shattering change in all of them. When I speak of AI, it's very clear what it is and what it is not for me. And AI is a system that reasons and that learns. If it reasons but doesn't learn, it's not AI. If it's learned but it doesn't reason, it's not AI for me. And for me, at least in, from a systems perspective, it's the bringing together of both of these that makes a difference. And those are the kind of systems that I care about the most. Just briefly, I'm, I'm sure all of you know this, if you think about the history of AI, we've gone through several winters. AI in general, its beginning ages was very, very symbolic. Even the early days of machine learning were very, very symbolic. And it wasn't until we saw that perfect storm come together that deep learning really made a difference. And now we've seen an explosion of this where there are many different approaches to machine learning. In fact, what you see here is the beginnings of our understanding of the patterns in machine learning itself. So here's the problem then, <coughs> because it's a systems problem. Gary Marcus, a, a dear friend and colleague of mine, um, he you may have seen him if you follow him on Twitter. He is very, very much... Uh, promoting the importance of neuro uh, neurosymbolic uh, architectures as as a systems engineering problem, and he's he's really bashed a lot of folks, some prominent ones, who tend to view deep learning as the end all for AI, but it's not. Uh, in his view, and I very much celebrate what Gary said, it's simply a tool in the box of building systems. Um, and in fact. One example of that, I am a connectionist platform. I'm made of a several hundred billion uh, neurons, very different neurons than the artificial ones, and I create models that are symbolic. In fact, we're communicating in a symbolic way, and we're manipulating those at a different level of abstraction. Therefore, it's never either or, but it's always both of these. And the amazing thing evolution has done for us is to allow this exquisite mixture of the symbolic and the neural within our brains. So having lived through a number of not just AI algorithms and AI parts, I've been living through a number of AI systems, and there are some conclusions we can begin to draw about the life cycle from a systems perspective. On the right-hand side, there's some fascinating work that's been going on in just the, the, the model life cycle. Now, as it turns out, this looks an awful lot like the way that Barry Bame spoke of the spiral model of software development. Waterfall model says you do requirements, you design, you do construction. Barry Bame, back in the 70s and 80s, said, no, that's not quite right. But really, software development is more of an iterative and evolutionary approach to development. And that's the stage of maturity that machine learning uh, life cycles seem to be in in the moment, that we do a little bit of each, we go through a cycle, we build something, we do it again. Now, Keep in mind, though, that well, whereas most of you are probably building interesting systems in the laboratory, I'm interested in taking those things from the lab and putting them in the real world. 
So it now becomes a larger problem of taking that small life cycle and beginning to apply it to problems of continuous integration and continuous deployment. So this is where AI hits the modern era of what we know how to do in, in software development. So what will tend to happen, and this is sort of the 65,000 foot view of the world, you may continue on with your your local processes for developing your machine learning, but ultimately from the outside, they're just black boxes to us who are systems builders. They may come with their own tests, and I will treat them as a box that become, in effect, my unit test. Your system is my subsystem, and it becomes a part of that continuous learning. Now, this has an important implication because in continuous integration and continuous deployment, it means that I need to worry about versioning. And we're not quite there yet. Well, I'll go further. We aren't there close at all in the machine learning world about being able to deal with the balance of versioning of models and versioning of the software itself. Both of those are things that need to, from a systems perspective, go under configuration management. I haven't seen Git yet effectively applied to large-scale models for ML. We'll get there, but we aren't quite there yet. <clears throat> the other phenomena that's happening in the, the uh, AI space is, again, reflecting exactly what happened in the non-AI space. Remember in one of my early slides, I showed you this rise of components. Same thing is happening, the rise of, rise of platforms as well, where you saw the beginning of tooling, which was very scattered, literally hundreds if not few thousand different approaches. And as time and experience and as those platforms began to merge, you started seeing the evolution of various platforms. Uh, TensorFlow in particular, PyTorch on the other, uh, Epic, you know, dichotomy between the two. I tend to use TensorFlow and Keras, TensorFlow and Keras myself. Uh, but you know, choose your own, choose your own uh, uh, mechanisms here. But the reality is, the economic forces of the marketplace are going to lead to a, um, a shuffling out of this marketplace, and we're going to see a few of them that will become dominant completely over time. As you go back to that life cycle, that, that spiral life cycle I mentioned, this is how we can sort of put it out in a linear fashion. Um, I think another thing that surprised a lot of the companies I work with who are trying to bring ML into their work is they realized, wow, it's not just a matter of hiring a lot of bright people who know machine learning, it's also about hiring a lot of data scientists who know how to bring the right data together. In fact, it's fair to say that most organizations underestimate the amount of, of skills and the amount of time they have to spend on just the data sciences parts, part of it. The AI algorithms are one thing, but trying to build the infrastructure of the data around it is another. And that unto itself is a whole lecture of how that particular uh, industry is, is evolving. And the same things we knew in systems engineering from before, uh, being able to have versioning, being able to uh, build models for which we have tests, all these things we're relearning, if you very, 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 very much so. so you gather your data, you, you, uh, you curate the data, you train your models, you deploy the models, you monitor them and repeat. This is a cycle, and it's very much the spiral of what, uh, what Barry Bame spoke of. Now, I want to point you to a person that you, know, you guys ought to have her come talk, because she is just awesome. Angie Jones is a, a woman, a very bright woman, who's done a lot of work in the automation of testing, not just for systems, but for AI in particular. And she's done some tremendously innovative things in that space. So go take a look at, uh, go take a look at her work. I mean, my goodness, you see here, Jeff Dean even follows her. So follow her on Twitter. Um, in fact, the testing side of things, and I'm not a test expert, I'm, I'm only a user of tests. This is a, an aspect of of uh, machine learning and systems engineering that is an interesting uh, coming together because a lot of the early work in testing, very much waterfall oriented, you built tests relatively independent of things. We didn't even really know about unit testing back then. It was more system integration testing that drive, drove a lot of it. There was a lot of bulky automation testing that went on in the 
the late 90s. And we began to see as Agile took hold, this notion of continuous testing and unit testing, and indeed the ideas of TDD, test-driven development. And that's kind of where we are at the moment. Uh, the notions of DevOps, continuous integration, continuous testing, continuous deployment, that's what dominates the systems, and systems world, and we're beginning to see that influence the machine, la machine learning world. It's also going the other direction because we're beginning to see organizations that are using AI to build tests themselves. So there's this wonderful interplay between the two. I want to go back to Watson and tell you about their experience because this, I think, is an important, important lesson in testing. Um, so again, Watson Jeopardy using the pipe and filter architecture had literally hundreds if not a few thousand different AI pieces. And those could be tested separately. Simple things for, uh, for testing puns, for example, I could throw some throw some uh, text at it and say, did I find the pun in it or not? But that wasn't the systems problem. Happily, in the Jeopardy world, there existed an archive of every public broadcast of Jeopardy, the game, the TV game, every question and every answer. There were several tens of thousands of those. And so the team was able to tap into those. And one of the first things they did was to build up a set of automated tests so that literally overnight, you could uh, run your built system against those tests. You'd wake up in the morning and say, I passed this many of them and I failed these. And that gave the team therefore things that they could, they could uh, work on. And so in the war room of the Watson team, they would have a chart that would be updated every night. It would give them this incredible graph that would tell them where they were in the, in the correctness of questions and answering. And by the way, we also had similar uh, data for humans and their ability to, uh, to get correct. So our goal was always to beat the best humans. And we knew that when we were consistently uh, crossing the threshold of what the top three humans had done, then we had done something right. Again, a good example of testing at the system level for these things. There's another factor of, of these systems that plays a role. And whereas most of you are probably attending to the, the, the software side of it, there's also a hardware side of it. And this is where DevOps comes into play. And this is the interplay of your algorithms and the distribution to the devices themselves. Uh, I've got a particular case where I'm dealing with that right now, in fact. So we're working, see, can I talk about this? Yes, I can. So there's a, a, a ship manufacturer called Promare out of the UK that has built or is building an autonomous vessel <coughs> called the Mayflower. Go Google it and you'll find them. Mayflower is a 65-foot trimaran, uh, and it's intended to be able to move from the UK across the North Atlantic unattended. Now, there'll be people supervising it, but it, it's meant to navigate the high seas all on its own. Uh, we're building some models for it that detect whale song. Uh, why is this important? It's part of some research activities I'm involved with here in Maui, uh, but it, it also is very relevant because you want to not hit a whale as you're moving a ship back and forth. So being able to detect them is a good thing. There's also an important research angle in that right whales are heavily endangered in that space. So working with one of the world's leading uh, researchers in whale song, a gentleman by the name of Jim Darling, and uh, a woman, Beth, from the Jupiter Foundation, they've been able to give me hours upon hours of whale song data. And we've been able to take that and train um, a classifier to reasonably identify humpback whale song. That's cool. Problem is, it's on the cloud, and I'm not going to take the cloud with me. So we've been going through an exercise of trying to shrink down that model from the cloud to literally put it on a cluster of, of uh, Raspberry Pis. So, and we're, we're on the path to do that. This introduces, therefore, another challenging angle as I move my algorithms because putting them on the cloud is one thing, but then delivering them at scale to the edge is a different beast of it. 
I'm not an expert in edge computing. I just happen to use it a bit. And so my lesson here is pay attention, stay tuned, because another development you're going to see in the space of AI algorithms is this migration to the edge themselves. NVIDIA is doing some amazing things. And my prediction is that what's going to happen is you're going to see the evolution of AI architectures that are designed such that they can relatively seamlessly move from the cloud to the edge and back. My further guess, and my further prediction is you're going to see this come to be a part of Kubernetes. Kubernetes is primarily meant for symbolic kind of things. You're going to see the interplay of Kubernetes and AI very, very soon. Another thing that this impacts, and largely again on the, the hardware side of it, is that I don't need as accurate of computation. And so we're beginning to see some interesting developments as people try to pair off the accuracy of their devices upon which they run these and see just how far they can go with our models. As we found with our humpback whale work, we don't need 64-bit and 32-bit precision. It's absolutely overkill. 16 bits, great. We may even be able to get it down to less than that, which is an important thing as we move to the edge. Um, Andref, who, who, who has worked uh, in PyTorch deeply, go take a look at this particular link here. And he's got some really interesting lessons that he has uh, uncovered with regards to the interplay of neural networks and putting them into production. And he's observed that, you know, this fundamentally is a code problem. It's a code base problem. And it's just like the problems we had in symbolic systems as well. So my lesson to you here is this, that although you may be, you know, deeply enjoying yourself in the, in the, in the models you're building, keep in mind that that's just software itself and therefore is amenable to configuration management and unit testing just like the symbolic systems we have done for years, very much the, his experience as well. Therefore, I would conclude that the traditional best practices that we know in symbolic systems, they also apply to AI. Test-driven development is a lifesaver in, uh, in symbolic systems. And what that means, go read the work from Uncle Bob Martin. He'll tell you a lot about what TDD is all about. But it literally means being able to define your tests before you even write your first line of code. And that's relevant because it will shape then what you actually end up building. Continuous integration and continuous delivery is an important piece of it as well. Version control I mentioned. And, you know, quite frankly, as some of the, the folks in PyTorch have, have realized, having a data file centric view of the world, even for your models, becomes something that, that really, really works. Um, another lesson here I should, I should make is this. This is uh, a representation of the whole world of computing, and this is from a model from the ACM themselves. Uh, on the right-hand side, we've got AI as one box, machine learning is a smaller box, deep learning is yet a smaller box. This is an obviously important piece of computation, but it is just a piece. And so the lesson here being is that, yes, do wonderful things and extraordinary things, but ultimately it is still part of a system. In fact, to that end, there's this delightful book called Systematics by John Gall. It's a play on words. It's the word system and his observation that systems play antics on us. And he has observed that everything is a system. Everything is part of a larger system. Your system is probably my subsystem. And this is absolutely true in the AI world itself. You can't make them work, but you can start them from scratch and you grow them over time. True of symbolic systems, true of neural systems as well. So in fact, let's, let's pop up another level of abstraction here. Um, <laughs> I've been getting into it with the head of AI at, at Facebook, if you've been following my Twitter feed. There's a really interesting set of discussions going on regarding uh, ethical issues. Uh, what triggered this is a gentleman that put out uh, a GitHub project that allowed him to take down sampled images and recreate uh, highly sampled, uh, uh, high resolution images from them. And someone took a low sampled image of Barack Obama, ran it through this, and it turns out it translated into a very, very white man. Uh, 
And so there's an interesting discussion, interesting in a very interesting way of putting that word, about the nature and the ethics of that. The important point here is that as I look back in the history of symbolic systems, these are the kinds of forces that weigh upon them. In general, the legal and ethical issues were by and large secondary and tertiary issues for most of the systems that people built. But in the world of AI, the legal and ethical issues, and especially the ethical issues, absolutely dominate. I guess my lesson to you is, and I got into it with a gentleman just the other day on it, that you may be enjoying yourself just focusing upon the software, but please keep in mind these are all ethical issues that are going to impact you. Um, let's see here. I see a chat coming up. Okay, okay, nothing. Uh, so let's continue on. Let me hide the chat. Sorry, there we go. Wanted to make sure it was, it was not uh, nothing I needed to see. So a few last lessons here. Um, I come from a systems engineering point of view, and from that point of view, keep in mind that architecture is a very important thing. All architecture is design, but not all design is architecture. Architecture represents the most significant design decisions that shape a system. This is true even in machine learning systems, that you have an architecture. You're going to make design decisions about the number of layers you have, uh, the width of those layers, the, the separation of those layers, what you have between those layers. Those are all architectural decisions. Treat them as such. Now, here's another area that hasn't yet been applied to the world of AI, but I see it starting to do so. It's an important lesson that Philippe Krushten, um from, uh, in fact, he, he is in, in Canada himself. He's at, uh, on the West Coast. He came up with this notion that as I look at the architecture of a system, I have to look at it from four different perspectives. I have conceptual views, which is my sort of logical class-based view and the view based upon processes. And there's the physical view, the component view, and the deployment view. Um, I've not seen yet people apply this formally to machine learning. But I start, I'm starting to see people begin to apply this. So I urge you, if you're in the ML space, go take a look at the link I have here for you. Go take a look at Philippe's paper, the 4 plus 1 model view, and be, ask yourself if you can start looking at your ML architectures from different views as well. Um, from... From systems architecture, we know these things to be true, that having a separation of concerns is important, and that's led us to systems that are layered, that focus upon microservices that are containerized, and it leads us to the ability to have geographically distributed systems themselves. It's also the case on the logical side of it that building crisp abstractions, having a balanced distribution of responsibilities, focusing upon patterns and simplicity, simplicity we know that this works. Now, if I step back from all of this, ignoring if it's an AI or not AI, there's a common pattern we see. Uh, Brand Selleck, a dear friend of mine from years ago, he's still alive, don't worry, uh, came up with this chart literally on the back of an envelope. And it expresses the common life cycle we see in every system, time across the x-axis, uh, intensity of an effort across, across the y-axis. So at the beginning of a system, I will focus upon discovery, and that will drop down over time. That's a red line. And then I begin through a process of invention where I'm trying to build things that work against it. And then I will go through a process of implementation. This is not a discrete set of steps, but rather it is overlapping steps. And every one of your systems will go through this same kind of life cycle. What a continuous integration, continuous deployment life cycle offers you is this heartbeat that you see at the bottom and, as the dots in the bottom show, gives you what Herbert Simon speaks of as intermediate stable points. Herbert Simon, in the delightful book, The Sciences of the Artificial, one of the early AI researchers, go take a look at that book, it's awesome. Uh, he's observed that all systems go through this. And so this is something that even in our machine learning systems, this is a process to which we try to, to move. Earlier, I mentioned that there's an interesting interplay between organization and architecture, and that if you show me your organization, I'll show you your architecture. We're beginning to see patterns that emerge that tell us the kinds of organizations we need for AI systems. 
Uh, this is a, a chart that, that Matt and Manuel put together that just briefly begin to describe <coughs> the patterns we're seeing in AI versus symbolic systems. That, that a lot of the edge-based AI things you see here on the right, right hand side, those image recognition systems, they look an awful lot like the same style that we see on UI systems in the sense that there's this tight life cycle between uh, implementation and, and testing the system, and there's this wonderful little loop that goes back and forth. So again, I'm not a UI expert, but this is an interesting area for exploration for you to say, are there in fact patterns from which I can learn from the UI world that might apply to the way that I organize my AI systems themselves? Another implication of this is that as I look at bringing AI into a larger system, you're generally going to have your teams that are organized in this very same way. You'll have a number of folks who are on the, the platform itself, some on the UI side, some on the, some on the AI side, and therefore you will most likely end up with teams of teams. Okay, let's see. And then, uh, let's see, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. I want to make sure we have some time for questions. Uh, here's here's sort of the future. I mean, this is a this is a wonderfully interesting time for us because we have uh, we've had breakthroughs in in AI algorithms. We have the computational power there for us. We're beginning to see this fusion of AI and non AI systems, but the pendulum keeps coming back and forth. That the problem of orchestrating these symbolic connection systems, and I'm going to even add to it, quantum models computing. That's where a lot of the work is, is taking place right now, and there's a lot of opportunity for exploration there. Um, it's also the case that we see the architecture move, the pendulum move back and forth between the edge and cloud, and so we're, we're not quite there yet in understanding the best practices, but there's work to be done. And lastly, the issues of scale are relevant to me because whereas you may be you know, building your algorithms that work well in the laboratory, uh, I'm interested in systems that might be deployed where potentially hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people are using them. And that's a problem all unto itself. So anyway, that's my journey here. It's been an interesting one. I continue to do work in, on, the, on the edges of AI and symbolic systems, and I'm having a lot of fun, and I hope you are as well, too. My goodness, I'm, I'm here back on the... Uh, the panel here, and we've got 300 of you souls watching this. So thank you, all of you, for joining us. And I'll now open it up for some questions. And I might even have some answers for you. Well, thank you very much, Grady. This, this has been really, really exciting. Oops, hang on a second. I realize I turned off my audio. All right, sorry, there we go. And I think I can hear you now. Yes, you I can? should be able to yeah. hear you now. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you, thank you very much for the for the amazing talk. I think it was uh, it was very comprehensive and uh, uh, and exciting. Uh, we have quite a few questions that actually came in uh, a bit late because I was thinking everybody was captivated uh, by by your talk and it was it was so uh, you know it was very well explained. Uh, I think there are very few, I, we, we get more like philosophical and discussion questions. So I'm going sure. to step right into that. Uh, Luis Cruz uh, asks, like uh, most, of, most of the engineering problems in machine learning have already been solved up to a degree by software engineering disciplines, including automated testing, version control, continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment. What is the big gap? Should we try to shape existing software engineering technologies or we need to reinvent our approach? We heard in previous talks that we face more of an education challenge rather than an engineering challenge. What do you think on this? I think it is an education as well as a tooling challenge uh, because there's not a good tooling infrastructure for ML quite yet. Every one of the <coughs> projects with which I've been engaged have had to build their own bespoke uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline. There are, well, this is true even for symbolic systems, but you add AI to it as well, where the, uh, the infrastructure for all the tooling we see for AI hasn't quite found its home yet in the traditional uh, CI, CD tools. 
So, but that's, that's going to solve itself over time. Give it a little bit of time. That's an area for exploration that people themselves could follow. So I think tooling, tooling will happen. Education is probably the larger issue because if you're focused upon, if your head's down, you know, trying to build a deep learning system, uh, testing is, is yet a whole nother set of skills that uh, you probably don't have time for. And so this is why having teams of teams where you can kind of delegate some of that infrastructure to others. We did this with the Watson team. There were, this, so Watson was, original team was about 30 or so software developers. And there were two main architects. And then uh, David was sort of the Uber architect. But then a whole tools team whose entire responsibility was to provide the tooling to feed in to the entire team itself. The same model is going to apply in systems at scale for ML. Oh, thank you very much. So we'll move to the second question by uh, Amrita Hotwani. How do you see the symbolic system best practices implemented when one, the community does not agree on the methodology and tools for experiments in R&D? Uh, for example, some use Jupyter notebooks, others only work with uh, scripts and so on. And two, machine learning and data scientists do not necessarily have a strong software architecture and software development background. Well, wow, an interesting story here. Um, we're all living under the, uh, the threat of COVID-19. Uh, a few months ago, you may recall that Imperial College uh, came out with a model for, vi for the virus, and that model was used by the UK government to pretty much lock down the entire nation. Well, as we and others dug into it, the gentleman who wrote that model eventually made that model open source, turned out to be a, several tens of thousands of lines of really badly written C++. And so what we do, and so the nation was shut down based upon that. So you're absolutely correct that there's a lot of really bad software out there upon which human lives decisions are indeed made. And uh, not to point fingers, but uh, I, I reached out to a gentleman who works in climate and weather modeling, and he said, you know, this is absolutely pervasive because we who build these systems, we're not software engineers. We're modelers, we're physicists, we're meteorologists, and we're sort of building our own worlds that we happen to do so in software itself. So what you describe is a pervasive systemic problem that I'm not going to solve here in a one hour lecture or a one hour mm -hmm. answer, except to say that the good news is that with events such as happened with Imperial College, the problem is becoming at least recognized more so that the problems in data science, I think are becoming aware of the issues themselves and there are folks like Angie that I mentioned who are very vocal about the importance for discipline, not just for the software developers in this space, but also for the data scientists in the space. So, you know, this is what the next generation of folks are going to have to work on. It's a hard problem. It's a systemic problem. But at least we know it's a problem, and that's encouraging. Mm -hmm. Thank you very Go much. Go invite Angie and have her talk to you. She'll yes, give you a wonderful yes. lecture. That was a good pointer. Uh, so we have um, another question by uh, Jeremy Bradbury from Ontario Institute of Technology. Uh, Jeremy asks, uh, thinking of the example you mentioned of a machine learning algorithm converting a low-resolution photo of Barack Obama into a high-resolution photo of a white man, what are practical steps we can take to address ethical issues in AI related uh, to the inherent bias of AI systems? For example, question. in AI teams, better data sets? Great question. Um, so a very, very classy example here. And what I and others have been bashing a certain gentleman at Facebook about on this very topic is that he placed it, and I'm not going to mention names here, he placed this as an entirely a problem of, of uh, data set selection. And we're all telling him, no, it's not. That even if I had an image of every human who ever lived, it would still produce results that were ethically very dubious. 
uh, the epicanthal fold, which you could not recreate from a low sample image, which a large percentage of the population has, you're going to end up with images that still look very, very, very wrong. So as I think people have observed, this is this is not a problem that can be solved just by getting the right data sets. It's a larger issue. I'm going to dodge the question a little bit by saying I am not an expert in ethics and AI. I just happen to deal with it. So I would point you to people such as Francesca Rossi, who is IBM's representative to the Partnership for AI. And the Partnership for AI in particular is beginning to develop some guidelines, approaches, ideas for how one attends to ethics and AI itself. The the one lesson I'll tell you is that whereas I can do some things on the algorithms themselves, ultimately it is a systems issue. Go back to the example I mentioned from Europol. There are tremendous opportunities for violations of privacy and security if I were to go down the path of automating all of that. That is not an issue of just a single algorithm. It's a systemic issue and therefore uh, all AI and all systems have these kinds of ethical implications. I'll just leave it at that. Great. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a liberty here. I'm going to ask a question that is not like the most voted one, but uh, I think we're going to miss a huge opportunity if we don't ask you that. <laughs> sure. So uh, Yonetara Kawada asks, what books would you recommend for uh, MLOps or AIOps? If you have any, any. Oh, that's a great one. I'm looking back behind me. <laughs> the bookshelf literally behind me. Uh, these, this shelf is primarily my books on AI. I've got books over on the other side about software architecture and the such. So who, who asked the question? Yonetaro Kawada. So that's the book you should write. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's what I'll say. I know of no such book that that dives into that in detail so i would view that as an opportunity for you to write one so and i would be happy to read it so and, thank and, you no there, yeah. there i know of no such book yet i know of some people who are writing some things in that particular space but they aren't there yet in, in that case in that case you can also read the research produced by the polytechnic group we have <laughs> we there have you some. go <laughs> yes. So, yeah. So, uh, one more question by sure. uh, Fatima Farr. Uh, what are your advice, uh, your advice, best practices for uh, the deploying AI ML models? It's a more of a technical uh, question. Specifically, the models are usually uh, developed in Python and they should be integrated and executed in other languages like Java, for example. How do you deal with... Uh, non-homogeneous systems uh, during the deployment of AI models? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, all the systems I deal with are non-homogeneous. I've, yeah. uh, I've got a thing I'm working with. It's, it's in multiple languages. So assume that it's going to be that place. Um, how do I address that? Well, I, I use Git. Uh, it works well for cross multiple languages for me. We sort of lash together our own test harnesses and CI, CD frameworks themselves. I mean, here's a case where, where test automation and CI automation hasn't quite caught up yet to it because most of them do assume homogeneous environments. And all I can tell you today is that you kind of have to do what everybody else is doing at the moment. You got to build your own bespoke kind of framework to do so. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but that's the reality of it. I don't see any yeah. tools that will help us there yet. So that that's another uh, area of another opportunity. Uh, yes, another opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I guess we have some time to take one last question because you, you told us that uh, you need to leave on the hour mark. Yeah, I've got a hard uh, just stop. a reminder. Yeah, just a reminder for our attendees. We will definitely forward you the uh, the questions. And uh, if you find anything particularly interesting, uh, you can send us the responses and we can post it online exactly as we're going to do uh, with the other speakers. So we have a question from uh, Professor Jack Jiang from uh, York University. Uh, many AI-based systems will involve human one way or the other, for example, also known as the, the human in the loop. How would you envision to design the architecture of such kind of AI-based systems? Okay, um, great question. 
um, a dear colleague of mine, Eva, uh, uh, Ivor Jakobsen, came up with the idea of use cases. He, he's the notion who, he's the gentleman who coined that term. So use case-based development, story-based development, those are the try and tried and true approaches that we know in systems engineering. They also apply to AI systems as well, too. So I would simply say we understand how that works, and it works for AI as well. That's certainly how we've approached it. That's the short answer. Excellent, excellent. So uh, with that, uh, I would like, first of all, to thank Grady for uh, the great talk, for being with us at the SEMLA 2020. I would like to thank every and each one of you of our more than 300 uh, <laughs> attendees. You've made this a very successful webinar. So I am good. Well, we have somebody else want to say hello, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> hello. <laughs> so uh, I'll have to uh, switch back to sharing my screen as well. Um, okay. Thank Excellent. you all very much. Thank you, Grady. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you.